In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come divine will to reign on earth. Come divine will to reign in me. Come divine will to reign on earth. Come divine will to reign in us. Come divine will to reign on earth. Come divine will to reign on earth as in heaven. Louisa, little daughter of the divine will, teach us to live in the divine will. This talk is uh, maybe even a little more demanding than the first one on the cross, and it's, it's because it's about our work, our part. In fact, <clears throat> as I look uh, through the volumes, it seems to me, and maybe it just jumps out at me, I'm not sure, maybe it's because there's so much more growth needed in me, but it seems like there's a lot more about what we're called to, what I'm called to in our self-donation so that <clears throat> he can bring about in us the height uh, for which he created us to be uh, <clears throat> like the Blessed Mother, co-redemptrix. We're small C, she would be a capital C uh, for co-redemptrix, being with, and we also have the privilege of being co-redeemers as well, but it's with his own life, his own love, uh, which is far more than anything that we could generate even in the uh, best possibility of living the virtuous life. In fact, in volume 24, uh, he says that to reach the fullness or the gift of living always in the divine will, operating in the divine volition, that's what the divine will is doing in everything, uh, the uh, rotation of the planets and the fluttering of the wings of the butterflies and all the birds and everything that is in motion, <clears throat> The, uh, a son or daughter of the divine will that is uh, fused in uh, the divine volition is participating with everything that God is doing everywhere, past, present, and future. This is mystery beyond our grasp. But in order to be elevated to that point, uh, it takes the perfection of the virtues 24-7. Now, we can't make that happen. But we can want it to happen. And the more that we want what God wants, the more he can move us along that path. And so whenever there's something in us that's a resistance, a hesitancy, or even a failing related to the perfect uh, virtuous act, we need to acknowledge it before God and invite the most holy will of God to bring about that perfection in us in every virtue. And actually, Jesus says to Louisa, <clears throat> there's more than just the virtues that we have listed in the catechism. There's infinitely more because it's the goodness of God, the very uh, attributes of God that he wants to share with his little sons and daughters. I mentioned before this reference to legitimate children. We know that everybody who's baptized becomes, at baptism, an adopted son or daughter of God. But uh, Jesus used this term legitimate children, and it's not like baptized, adopted sons and daughters of God are not legitimate, but not at the level of the fullness of his own life uh, operating in everything that we say and do. And so <clears throat> the little crosses, as were mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, um, are how he moves us along to this fullness that he wants us to have to the glory of God. In fact, the glory of God is man and woman fully alive and no human being is fully alive unless the very fullness of life reigns in and animates the sons and daughters of God. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, worldly, humanly willful have always frantically scrambled to avoid suffering. In the Old Testament times and certainly in New Testament times and especially in our times. Except when in the pursuit of some perceived personal benefit and therefore self-centered gain. So you can think about, and all of us have done it in the course of our lives, gone through some kind of discomfort, even pain, might even be suffering, if there was a perceived good or benefit that we were pursuing. I think about when I was in sports, and those of you who were in sports, I think about all the different things that we do. How about uh, dieting to lose X number of pounds, not so much as a fasting, but because we want to look better when we look in the mirror. I'm way past that possibility. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's different sufferings we can bring upon ourselves if it's something that we really want, and, and it can have nothing to do with God. And then when we uh, hear the suggestion that we 
We do some extra fasting, but not so that we lose weight, but so that we really are uh, experiencing a hunger for God or a uh, continuity with those that have no food, or there can be different focuses in a genuine fasting, but only uh, the height of that fasting, the beauty of that fasting, if we invite the divine will to be the life of our fasting so that we are, in fact, one with him in his 40 days of fasting. I mean, he already made it perfect for us. Every single act of ours has been already established perfectly. Our lives, perfectly. And so <clears throat> it's as if suspended. It's already accomplished. You know, uh, the non-Catholics uh, that believe in Jesus, they, they like to say he did it all. But a lot of times, and it is true, he did it all. But a lot of times it's <clears throat> a, a, a justification for not having to fast and not having to sacrifice and not having to do anything that's other than what we just want to do in the course of our lives. It's not sinful, but not really ordered towards his glory and honor. Because he did it all. Well, the reality is he did do it all so that we could appropriate it. It's like already finished for us, a victory of every aspect of our lives already finished for us. You know, uh, I've said this many times in previous presentations, there was a, a lady that had some severe disabilities. This was back uh, in the 90s. And uh, she was coming to some of the classes, uh, but when she started hearing this embracing of suffering and this self-offering and suffering, this uh, <clears throat> being one with him and his suffering, one day she stopped me after the meeting was over outside a church and she said, I can't do this anymore, I can't study this anymore. And I said, why not? I mean, you, you, you're perfectly prepared to give him everything that you're going through in this terrible suffering that you have in the course of your life. And she said, I'm just so afraid there'll be something more. And, you know, there's that self-preservation part of us, this, this point of human, worldly, humanly willful, have always frantically scrambled to avoid suffering. And there was a little element of that she wanted to say her prayer. She wanted to get to heaven. She didn't want to offend God, but she was afraid that if she surrendered any more than what was already happening in her religious practices, that he was going to say, okay, now I'm going to let you have it. And it's not that way with God. Just as we heard in uh, previous presentations, mine and Steve's and uh, in Vicky's, already our lives have been planned, but not forced. Before we were conceived in our mother's womb, he knew us. And it's not like he just knew of us. He had a unique, specific plan with the gifts and talents that he put into the existence of who each and every one of us are. Everything we need for the fulfillment of what he created us to be and to do is already there. We can thwart it. We can ruin it, or we can learn how to have his life animated. And if we do that, then we're participators in the greatest work that God could accomplish in humanity because we are privileged to live in this time in human history. And we don't deserve it, but he chose to put us in this beginning stage of the reign of the divine will on earth as in heaven. And you know, <clears throat> You don't have to look too far on the internet to have uh, all kinds of uh, presenters say that this is it. This is it. Well, they were saying that in the first 100 years of Christianity. In fact, there were no scriptures written until about year 65 because they thought his second coming was imminent. And it was because they took some things that he said and they thought, well, it has to be this way. And then when they realized, oh, we better commit this to uh, parchments because we may be gone, and they need to have what has been entrusted to us to pass on. And this is the reality for us. We have a part to play. And he will animate our perfect contribution to his plan for the divine will reigning on earth as it reigns in heaven, if we cooperate, if we want what he wants. In volume 1, page 73, Jesus said, uh, virtues become weak if they are not strengthened and fortified by the grafting of the cross. Before my coming upon earth, pains, confusions, disgraces, calumnies, sufferings, poverty, illnesses, 
and especially the cross, were considered dishonors. And we know that to be true in the, in the New Testament. When there was somebody who was paralyzed or somebody that had uh, uh, blindness or muteness or whatever, <clears throat> the apostles would want to know, well, who was it, the father or the mother? And certainly they would, it's normal for them to expect that because in the Old Testament, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we have the Lord saying the sins of the parents will be suffered down upon the third and fourth generation. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. So they impact us, but it's not forced upon us. It's a weakness that can be mended. It's a weakness that can be part of our cross that we uh, bear well. But <clears throat> because of those scriptures, they expected or understood that any time there was some kind of lack in the life of an individual, it was because of their own sins or always because of the sins of the parents. And while sometimes that was the case, there was an element of being faithful to God in that even though they didn't know the saving works that are known to us, and they absolutely did not have the privilege of the lessons on the divine will. Anyway, Jesus goes on to say, but from the moment they were born by me, he did everything. They were all sanctified and divinized by my contact. So every single moment of our lives, Every bit of suffering, I'll go back, pains, confusions, disgraces, these are Jesus' words, calumnies, sufferings, poverty, illnesses, and especially aspects of the cross, they're not dishonors unless we make them dishonors. Remember at Mass, there were those that were sick and tired of the food that they were having in the desert, and that was sin. They didn't recognize, even though maybe they were tired of quail and bread and manna, <clears throat> but to complain against the one who was feeding them was a sin. It was a rejection of the providential care and love of God. They didn't understand it as we do, but <clears throat> we are being called to understand that these uh, el uh, elements of suffering that I just read twice now, uh, they're gifts from God. I thought he loved me. I remember there was a, a very good and faithful woman who was being called to learn, and actually, thanks be to God, she's now studying Louisa's writings, but it took her a while because whenever in spiritual direction I would challenge her a little bit or tell her well, what she was complaining about was something that was really offered by God to her for her good, she would say, well, doesn't he want me to be happy? And yes, he wants us to be happy. But he wants us to be happy in eternity and happy that he loves us so much that he wants to get us ready to go more directly into the eternal glory that he has created us to enjoy. They all changed their appearance, all this suffering, they all changed their appearance, becoming sweet, pleasant, and the soul has the good of having some of them receives honor and this becomes uh, because she has received the vestment of me, son of God. So the very things that the world calls uh, evil or useless or to be avoided at any cost, he's saying that if we understand that these are gifts by which he shapes us more and more perfectly to an image and likeness of God, you know, nobody gets to heaven until they are perfect. Nobody gets to heaven until they're perfect. And so he wants the perfection of our lives, the fulfillment of the very reason he created us uniquely as individuals, to be reached here. But because of his unfathomable ocean of love and mercy, purgatory can be a finishing place. But if you stop and think about the so many saints in the history of the church and some of the greatest if you look at their last days, uh, I don't know that I could say every single one, but a huge percentage went through tremendous sufferings or trials, oppressions or exiles in their last days, tortures unto their martyrdom in their last days. And so the perfecting work is really what he wants to accomplish in us, but it takes our cooperation, our fidelity as we're going through that perfect, perfecting work. Uh, a wonderful 
document that everyone would do well to read is uh, Salvifici Doloris, or uh, in English, the, the, on the Christian meaning of human suffering by the great Saint John Paul. When I was in hospital ministry, I required everybody who was an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist that wanted to help in the hospitals to read that within their first month or so of wanting to join me in the hospital. Salvifici Doloris, on the Christian meaning of human suffering. And certainly, he lived it in front of the cameras for the whole world to see. There were some that wanted to tell him, you're too sick, you should step down. He knew that suffering unto death was what he was called to do in front of everybody. In the humiliation of hardly being able to talk and drooling towards the end of his days. And <clears throat> No, he bore his cross gloriously until his last breath. And <clears throat> That's the way the Lord perfects us in different ways for each of us in the course of life that he has given us. Only those, this is Jesus' words again, also from volume one, page 73. I know that you don't all use the same cluster that we do, but in one they're not dated because she's writing that while she's experiencing what's happening in her life in volume two. The reason we have volume one is because as the confessor is reading what's going on with her in her life, and he's already at the point, he's not like the first priests who were rejecting her and rebuking her and telling her she was faking it when she was going through all this suffering and when there was blood on the floor from her stigmatizations and uh, when they couldn't get her to animate because she was heavy as marble and men couldn't get around to pick her up. She couldn't move. She could hear what was going on, but she couldn't move. And so uh, she was rebuked for quite some time. But in volume two, the priest reading what's happening with her, he says... You have to write down what was happening before this point in your life. And that's what volume one is, and so we don't have dates. In volume one, we have on our cluster, page 73, only those who look and stop at the outermost layer, he uses the word cortex, only those who look and stop at the outermost layer of the cross experience the contrary, rather than recognizing it as gift, finding it bitter, they are disgusted by it, and they complain as if someone had done wrong to them. You know, many times in the hospital, I would have somebody just, say, they see the collar, and they're like, how could God let this happen to me? And uh, sometimes it was, I go to Mass every Sunday, and I pray a rosary once in a while, and how could God let this happen to me? And here Jesus is saying, as if someone had done wrong to them, and the point that he's making here is not to rebuke them, but to help us understand if you don't recognize a gift as gift, you just toss it aside. If you don't recognize the gift for the love of the giver of the gift, you can actually be angry that you didn't get what you wanted instead. And so what we need is a focus adjustment related to the trials, the hardships that God gives us, or else we shift into the pattern of complaining and moaning and groaning and wanting to tell everybody how unhappy we are or how hard it is. And, and you know, even someone who loves you, and it's not bad with husbands and wives to express that you're having a hard time and asking for prayer, but even someone who loves you, when you're trying to unload how miserable you are, is there really anything they can do about it? But if you tell the Lord you're offering Him that misery that you're experiencing, He can do infinitely good now and in eternity for you. And then Jesus ends with this last portion. He says, but those who penetrate into it, so instead of the outer wrappings of the cross or our understandings of the cross, his cross or our cross in life, but those who penetrate into it, finding it enjoyable, form their happiness in it. Now I underlined enjoyable. He's not saying you have to really be enjoying the fact that you just broke your leg. No. The enjoyment comes from the recognition of the value that it gives to you now and in eternity. Just like the, pick on guys for a minute, <laughs> I don't go to the gym anymore and it's obvious, but when I used to go to the gym, guys would be in front of that mirror and they would be going through a lot of pain, but boy, they were enjoying the fact that they were really bulking up. Ladies, you do the same kind of thing, maybe in the same manner. <clears throat> so 
enjoyment comes from the perceived benefit, even if there's suffering at the moment. And Jesus is saying, if we really understood the good that he makes possible, the good that he loads our souls with when we are surrendered to him and offering ourselves in union with his will, we would enjoy the fact that he's given us something that can bring that about. In volume 1, page 76, so just moving along a little bit more in the same cluster, Jesus would say to me, she writes, if you only knew, and well actually it's if you knew, but in the volumes whenever there's if you knew, I put in brackets if you only knew, kind of like if you only knew the good that's happening for you, you would not want to miss it at all. So anyway, I put if you only knew what good the cross contains within itself, how precious it renders the soul, precious it renders the soul to him. How precious it renders the soul and what a gem of inestimable value one acquires who has the good of possessing sufferings. You don't have to bring suffering upon yourself and you should certainly get the health care that's necessary. But you want to be careful not to run as quick as you can from every inconvenience and suffering that he tries to gift us with because <clears throat> we could miss out on what he has prepared for us for eternity. You know, um, I went to the doctor not too long ago. He had to cut into my leg. And uh, he's a very good, uh, faithful Catholic. And he says, this is going to hurt a little bit. It'll be something you can offer. I said, <laughs> this doctor understands what it's all about. And I don't think he just said it to me because I had a collar on. I, I know he knew that I would understand it if I had been well formed as a priest that I would understand there is value in every little inconvenience and discomfort that we experience if we offer it, and especially if we offer it in the divine will. In fact, this particular doctor said, I understand someone in our, in our practice is going with you on the pilgrimage to, uh, to Corrado. I said, yeah, I'd love to give you some information on that sometime. <clears throat> we look for the opportunity. We don't try to force it on people. Uh, if ever uh, I hear a request from him, I'll be happy to present it to him. It is enough to tell you only that in coming upon earth I did not choose riches or pleasures, but I cherished as dear and intimate, as intimate sisters, the cross, poverty, sufferings, and ignominies. So <clears throat> why would we think that we shouldn't have some of that if we want to be with him uh, when our time comes? I mean, he's the one that said, if you want to be with me, you must take up your cross and follow me. And he didn't mean take up your cross and walk behind me. <laughs> and maybe for up to this point or uh, times recently, you thought that's what it meant. I'm supposed to just carry my cross behind him. No, we are to take up our cross and follow him in the manner with which he embraced the cross and put it to work in the self-offering for the sake of others. It, um, then, while saying this, he would show such taste, such joy for suffering, that those words pierced my heart through like many burning arrows, to the point that I would feel in my life, I would feel my life leaving me if the Lord would not concede me some suffering. So, <clears throat> he did for Louisa what I mentioned earlier, he did for St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. When he gave St. Mother Teresa a sense of his thirst for souls, he, it was a gift of his own desire for the salvation of souls. She then went searching for souls so that she could help them find their way to the Lord. She was compelled with his own desire, his thirst for souls. And Louisa is saying here, I was compelled to have sufferings that I could then offer to him. You know, uh, when, uh, when the uh, vicar for uh, the Pious Association said uh, on a little video clip, uh, Luis's writings are not about suffering. He didn't mean there's no message about suffering in her writings. What he was trying to help people who maybe be frightened to hear that there's suffering mentioned in her writings, <clears throat> it's about love. It's about God's love. 
Luis's writings are about how much he loves us and how much he wants to give us while we're here on earth so that we're ready to receive all that he created us to enjoy for all eternity, which is beyond anything a human mind can grasp. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered in the minds of men and women the things that God has prepared for us. <clears throat> uh, you won't just get a planet. A planet? I thought I was going to get a little mansion. A big mansion. No. What he has in store for you is eternal and without limit. But we can thwart the, uh, the fullness of what he has created us for if we moan and groan and complain and just wish we could get out of any kind of inconvenience. No. He wants us to recognize with an enjoyment the, the pain that is involved in the pursuit of the benefit that he has prepared for us. And he'll only give us but he also gives us the strength to endure. But we can feel like we're, we're without the help to do this. Lord, I don't know if I can take any more. <clears throat> and if it, reality is all that we can really take, that's all he's going to give us as gift to shape us in his image and likeness. On February 8, 1905, we have these words. Oh, January uh, 28, volume 6, January 26, 1905. The cross is seed of virtue. And I just mentioned a moment ago that the Lord says very clearly in the upper volumes, the beginning of the upper volumes, that perfection in the virtues is necessary to receive the fullness of the gift of the divine will. Uh, you know, a lot of times I meet people that uh, they say, I've got the gift of the divine will. I'm living in the divine will. And uh, I, I say, well, that's wonderful. Um, but usually, if a person really is a recipient of the gift, they'll be at the height of humility and they wouldn't be going around telling everybody that they've got the gift of the divine will. I mean, if I stood up here and said, I have reached the highest level of holiness that is humanly possible, would, would you think, well, you know, maybe this guy has a little uh, humbling necessary in order to get to where he thinks he's already arrived. So, <clears throat> it's a journey. And even in the upper volumes, Louisa is getting lessons on how to expand what he has already given her, and she has received the gift of the divine will, living 24-7. But it, <clears throat> uh, I don't think it happens all at once, even though some people have said that it has in their lives. They may have been given a, a huge gift in understanding to move forward, but <clears throat> uh, I think it's unlikely that we would be on a path uh, already completed and still here because it's a journey uh, of growth in the Lord. Anyway, January 28, 1905, the cross is seed of virtue. When a new cross comes to you, this is Jesus saying to us, when a new cross comes to you, you should rejoice thinking that you are acquiring another seed of virtue with which you can enrich, even complete your crown, thus receiving the full benefit for which that cross was presented. February 8, 1905, the characteristics of the children of God, love for the cross, love for the glory of God, love for the glory of the church. Jesus has used this term, legitimate children. He wants to move us to that legitimacy where his own life is coursing through our veins, is, is um, fusing our tissues with his light, radiating his light in every direction. You know, the transfiguration, there was no less light in him any other time from the moment of the incarnation till his last breath on the cross. <clears throat> there was no less light in those times than when he just let them have a little peek, just a tiny peek, which was blinding for them, of the light that he is. He is the light of the world. And he wants to fill us with that light. And if he fills us with that light, whether we sense it or not, it's going in every direction. It's bringing benefits, past, present, future, to those who are turning to him. There's a place where he says, uh, Luis is saying, you know, what good does a son or daughter in the divine will do? I'm, in her case, I'm just here in the bed and I'm saying my prayers and I'm making my rounds, but, you know, there's no miracles. There's no, and there were miracles. But she says, in her view, there's no miracles. There's, I'm not uh, bringing crowds. Well, she's bringing crowds. But I'm not bringing crowds. What is it that, what good am I? And Jesus says, a son or daughter in the divine will. When the divine will is reigning in that individual, it, uh, that one is, is the word of the preacher, the touch of the healer, 
So in other words, all the miracles, sons and daughters of the divine will, we participate. At what level? We'll understand later. We don't need to try to figure that out. Uh, October, in volume 7, October 8, 1906, the cross is to man as rain to a horse. Well, <laughs> he has to really hang on to the reins with this one, so I need a fair uh, amount of cross so that he can try to hold me back or get me turned when I want to go this way. <clears throat> and as long as we realize that's going on in us, we can renounce it and choose to go the way that he's trying to lead us with the reins of whatever aspect of the cross we experience. He says, the cross tames man, restrains him, arrests the course of his hurling himself along the paths of passions, which he feels within himself, and which devour him like fire. The world is on fire with passions of every kind. And uh, the problem is when we don't recognize those passions that are so self-defeating, we can just keep right on going. And uh, <clears throat> there's so many examples, and I'm not going to start giving them because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But we could definitely say to the Lord, wherever there are passions that are out of order in me, that need to be brought in under the reign of the virtues, please make it happen. And, uh, and you, could, you could add, no matter what it costs me personally, if you dare. Now, he won't say, oh good, I want to really make you miserable in life, but he will say, now that you've asked, you're on the path again, uh, you've been returned to the path of growing in the holiness that I intend for you before you cross the threshold called death, so that you're ready to enter into the white hot love of God that apart from being perfected, you would not be able to enter. So instead of raging against God and hurting himself, this is Jesus speaking, the cross dampens his passions, softens him, conducts him, and serves the glory of God and his own salvation. So when we are shaped more and more according to the very purpose that God has created us, he's glorified. You know, <clears throat> any of you who have artist, artistic talent, when you're bringing a masterpiece of yours to completion, it could be music, it could be an article, it could be painting, it could be sculpt, whatever your artistic talent is, and everybody has some. Some may be more obvious than others, but every one of us has a little artistic talent of one sort or another because we're created in the image of the one who created us. We're his art piece. And so uh, the artist is happiest when the final touches, the, the movement towards the perfections that uh, we had in uh, the previous uh, presentation, the, the beautiful hues of colors, divine colors, that he has uh, ordered just for us uniquely. Uh, volume 23, November 6, 1927, one who lives in the divine will does not descend from the, her origin and to her is due the state of queen or princess or prince, while one who lives outside of it lives the state of a servant. And this is the comparison, really, I'm going to go through this passage, but uh, the Lord tries to explain to us in various ways and in a variety of perspectives so that we can understand it better, the difference between doing the will of God and the divine will doing in us and then living in the will of God. <clears throat> the divine will doing in us is a divinized act. It reaches the past, present, and future. There's no limit to what he can accomplish because when the divine will is operating in us, it's God himself operating in us like the hand in the glove. The glove is the outer, it's the cortex. But the hand is what moves that glove. And <clears throat> when the divine will is the life of our actions, it's not like you all of a sudden become like an automaton, you can't do anything because God's will is animating you. No. It's like what happens at Mass or any of the other sacraments, but I'll use Mass. When the priest is saying the word, actually the moment he's processing in, and it's supposed to be 24-7 for priests, but the moment that he's processing in, so now he's moving into the, the mysteries of the sacred liturgy, okay? And the moment he's processing in, Christ himself is walking in that humanity. And he could be not a very nice guy, 
guys like me, or he could be he could be the holiest one that you know, but there's that's it's not his holiness. It's Christ Himself that's walking in. It's Christ Himself that is <clears throat> transubstantiating the bread and the wine into his body and blood. It's a divinized act. And the church has understood this even though it hasn't used the vocabulary of Louisa's writings to explain it. But I remember when I was talking to a, a very good and holy bishop and I was explaining this concept to him and I could see him getting all excited. And he knew it in his heart that this is the reality. He knew he was an altar Christus, but now he was having it explained from the simplicity of Louisa's writings. Christ himself truly operates in a priest and truly operates in you when you invite the divine will to move in your moving, walk in your walking, speak in your speaking, look through your eyes. <clears throat> and so uh, try not to have too much ownership. Try to have a donorship of all your actions, all your gestures, all your words, all your glances, so that Christ himself is more free to operate in and through you. Well, doing the will of God is a virtuous choice, and that's a good thing. But doing the will of God is like getting instructions and then doing it. And that's why Jesus refers to that reality like being a servant. So if you have a very good and faithful servant, and we know in the scriptures there are going to be some that on the day that they die, especially if they've reached the perfection that was possible for them, given what the Lord made possible for them in their call in life. So let's say they live their vocation beautifully and as virtuously as was possible for them according to their understanding of what the Lord wanted. Okay. Some of them are going to hear him say, well done, that good and faithful servant. And they will not be unhappy. They will be as happy as they possibly can be because no soul that's in heaven wishes it had more. It's full to capacity. But the capacity changes at the level of how much we are moved towards the legitimacy of sons and daughters of God. So the doing the will of God is a good thing, but it is strictly a limited thing in the tininess that we are as little specks on a planet. And uh, someone corrected uh, me, I appreciate it, 8.2 billion people on the planet. I knew there was a point two in there somewhere, but I forget things very quickly. <clears throat> anyway, 8.2 billion people on the planet right now. You're just one of the 8.2 billion and even if you lived a perfect life and you didn't have the divine will as the life of your life, how does that stack up over the other 8.2 billion? Just a tiny little speck. He's, he'll be happy with us for doing what was possible for us at the level that we understood. But he's saying, I want more than that for you. That's why I put you in this time in human history. I want to teach you how to live in a way that at least your acts act by act, will be me operating, and those acts will live forever. You, when you die, you'll look at your own acts that you gave to me, you invited me to reign in those acts, and you will see the beauty of me walking down the street when you said, come divine, will walk in my, in my walking. You'll see that when you were in the hospital and you put your hand on somebody's shoulder, when in your interior, you're saying, touch this one through me, O will of God that that one, that light goes into that soul. Not your light, but you're the vessel of that light. And so divinized acts are like that. And there will be some of us, as we're learning and inviting the divine will into our acts, for all eternity, we will thank God for the fact that those acts in us, which are our acts divinized by the Lord, so that they're ours, we will be delighted that we we're privileged to participate with God's own action in us. So that's step number two. Doing the will of God, little specks. Divinize acts, immensity, even though a lot of our speckness is still there. However, for those who strive to know and live the will of God perfectly and deliberately, he sees that we want what he wants, and the more that we learn how to cooperate as we read the volumes, he will take us by the hand, loving God that he is, patient God that he is, if he can be patient with me, he can be patient with any of you. And, if, and people that don't even go to church, he can reach out to everybody. And <clears throat> because he's a generous God, anybody that turns their heart towards him are on the path to whatever level of sanctification 
they learn about and surrender to so that he can do the, the perfection in us. And so some souls with that desire, learning and applying at the level that they understand, demonstrate to him this soul, he looks and he says, this soul esteems my greatest gift. This soul is willing to endure whatever is necessary, to let go of whatever is necessary, to have a detachment of the things that are like trinkets here on earth. You know, I love motorcycles. If somebody gave me a brand new motorcycle, it would just be a piece of junk in comparison to the things that God has prepared for us. So we cannot be attached to the things of this world as, as the goal. For some people, it's pleasure. That's called hedonism. And we have a world that's, that's running helter-skelter for one pleasure after another here on earth that does not satisfy. And that's why they keep looking and they keep trying new things and doing things that are worse and worse and worse because they can't find satisfaction in the deepest core of their being because God alone suffices. One who lives in the divine will does not descend. I stopped, make, she's saying, she's making the rounds. I stopped when he received the cross and embracing it with all the tenderness of his love. So she's embracing the cross, seeing how he embraced the cross. He, uh, uh, the tenderness of love, he placed it on his shoulders to carry it to Calvary. And Jesus said, my daughter, the cross matured the kingdom of redemption. So it brought to maturation, the fullness, it completed it and placed itself as the custodian of all the redeemed ones. So the little crosses we experience, the custodian is an act trying to keep us on track, trying to keep us humble, trying to keep us focused on the fact that we need him in order to complete our journey in such a way that if one lets herself be kept by the cross, she receives within herself the effects that a mature fruit re uh, contains. That contains sweet taste, vital humor, and makes her feel all the good of redemption. So the cross can bring a soul to that point in such a way that mat she matures together with the fruit of the cross, the sweetness of the cross, and disposes herself to return into the kingdom of my will. In fact, who has uh, disposed you to live in it? Has it perhaps not been the cross of so many years? And so here she was bearing that cross that she's now recognizing and esteeming, uh, putting her I love you on every aspect of the cross. <clears throat> our, actually she was putting our I love you along with hers, our thank you along with hers, our I adore, adore you along with hers. That's what we're to be doing for all souls. And especially for those who have no one to pray for them. And for those who have never been taught to pray. And sad to say there's a large number of people. Even some that go to church. That have never been taught to pray. They may pray. <clears throat> but if their prayer is please do this. Please fix that. Uh, please don't let this happen. Please make me better in this way. Give me this. Give me that. He hears it. And he sees the, the uh, infancy of that soul. He loves infants. But he would like maturation, and it takes the embracing of the cross and striving to live it in grace. Definition of the cross, and this will be my last reading. Uh, uh, volume 6, March 5th, 1905. Jesus came for a little and told me, My daughter, the cross is support of the weak. The cross is strength of the strong. The cross is seed and custody of virginity should be understood as purity of mind, heart, body, and soul. After communion, at every Mass, the priest, while purifying the vessels, he prays silently, What has passed our lips is food, may we possess in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. And we'll close with that prayer for priests. I put mine away, so we'll just do that middle part because I don't know them all by heart. I should. But in the middle part, we're asking for the divine will to come. It's on the very back of your uh, handouts. Oh, I think I'm going to get a copy. Thank you. So we'll pray the whole, uh, the whole prayer. In the name of the Father, with the intention we learned earlier, 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Eternal Father, I offer thee the precious body, wounds, and blood of thy beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb without spot or blemish, in reparation for my sins and for the sins of all thy priests. Come, divine will, by thy precious body, wounds, and blood, O Jesus, purify and sanctify thy priests and all souls. O Father, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named, have mercy on all thy priests and wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us strive to only and always live the will of God.